Today, our guest uh, will be uh, Keith Hawkins from the University of uh, Texas uh, at Austin. Uh, uh, he's a faculty member uh, at the university. Uh, Keith uh, got his PhD degree from the University of Cambridge, Cambridge, uh, UK, um, uh, where he worked with uh, Jerry Gilmore on dissecting the Milky Way using uh, uh, spectroscopic uh, surveys. Uh, then uh, Keith was a Simons Junior Research Fellow uh, at Columbia until 2018, uh, when uh, he joined uh, the faculty ranks at the University of uh, Texas. So Keith uh, works on a variety of topics related to the uh, galactic uh, evolution, uh, chemical evolution, Milky Way formation, uh, data mining surveys, uh, studying uh, uh, galactic and stellar uh, archaeology. Uh, during the talk, please let me remind you that to stay uh, muted, and if you uh, have a question, please raise your hand or type it uh, in the chat, and uh, I will ask it at the appropriate moment of time. So, Keith, uh, please uh, take it away. All right, I hope everyone can hear me, and thank you all for uh, coming to my talk, as well as for inviting me to give uh, this colloquium at, at Princeton and the uh, IAS. Um, and I also especially want to thank people for coming on uh, such a special day, which is election day. Um, I will be trying my best to, uh, you know, make sure that I am somewhat succinct and coherent in my talk as of yesterday. Yesterday I was out at Big Bend National Observatory and hiked the 14 and a half mile Southern Rim Trail. This is a, a wonderful image. So I know that this is a stressful day for everyone. So I thought I would start with a beautiful image of, of South Texas looking over to Mexico and a beautiful agave plant off to the left. And um, if you have to leave for any moment in this talk to go and vote, I do encourage you to do that. Um, voting is an extremely important part of our democracy, of course. So you know, please feel free to get off and vote if you need to. Um, but today's talk will be on you know what I work on, which is galactic archaeology, um, and especially in the Gaia and large spectroscopic survey era. Uh, and what you're seeing in the background here is the uh, McDonald Observatory, actually out in West Texas, and um, an image of the Milky Way also in the background. And galactic archaeology, if you haven't heard that buzz term, is is really asking some fundamental questions of you know of you know astronomy, things like how do galaxies form, how do they evolve, how do they assemble themselves over time, and how are they structured, right? And so these are all somewhat open questions. How do galaxies form is a pretty broad question, and there are some people that are interested in studying that question by looking at high redshift galaxies. Whereas if you're looking at our Milky Way to answer that question and using the Milky Way as a laboratory, then you're doing what's called galactic archaeology, um, which is essentially using fossil stars across the galaxy to understand um, and study uh, galaxy formation and galaxy formation physics. Um, I recently learned in a public lecture, I was giving a talk about galactic archaeology and you know, saying we use stellar fossils to study galaxy formation. And someone came up to me after the talk and said, well, you know, technically that's paleontology since paleontologists go out and look for fossils and archaeologists go out and look for human fossils or human human artifacts. And so uh, is it galactic archaeology? Is it galactic paleontology? You know, I don't know where I fall on that issue, but what I can say is the advantage of being a galactic archaeologist is that you can say that I'm the Indiana Jones of the galaxy. So I kind of like having that uh, in my back pocket to use. Um, but essentially, the reason why we use stars as fossils is because uh, the chemical makeup of stars is largely age invariant. And so that means that if you look at a star that's 10 giga years old, then whatever the chemical abundance is, by and large, this is not true for every element. Things like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen change over the course of the lifetime of the star due to dredge up processes and other types of internal processes in the star. But by and large, most of the chemical elements on the periodic table um, generally don't change over the course of the star's life. There are some effects, gravitational settling or radiative levitation that can change these elemental abundances, but by and large, these are relatively small effects. So the chemical makeup of a star generally doesn't change over the course of its life. And so you can use it to study how the Milky Way has evolved chemically, for example, over its long, you know, tens of 10 or so giga years of, of history. And so this is very similar to using, for example, um, ice cores. If you go out and you know, when, when geologists go out and dig ice cores up in Antarctica and they look for bubbles of early Earth's atmosphere that are trapped, um, you can do the same type of thing with stars um, using the chemical fingerprints, essentially. Um, and of course, these stars make up the Milky Way. And this is an artist's impression of the Milky Way, you know, a beautiful barred spiral galaxy. And this is kind of my laboratory um, for studying the, you know, galaxy formation questions. And so, of course, this is the this is one of the highest quality um, reconstructed images, if you will, of the Milky Way from the Gaia spacecraft, which I'll talk about quite a lot, quite a lot in this in this particular talk. Um, you can see the Milky Way um, here. Um, 
with its beautiful um, you know, structure and beautiful dark bands being the, the dust bands. And then you've got the large and small, small measure level clouds in the outskirts as well. Um, and then the galaxy, of course, has some structure to it. And that structure um, is not only part of what I study, but how that, how that structure came about is, is also what I study. Um, so it's got a structure um, such that it has a bulge in the, in the center parts of the galaxy that's metal rich and alpha enriched. And I'll talk about what I mean by alpha enriched in, in a few moments. Um, it's got a thin disk of, that is um, extremely thin, it's metal rich and alpha poor. The sun is a part of the thin disk um, and the thin disk is kinematically quite cold. So a lot of stars in relatively circular orbits, low velocity dispersion, everything's kind of nice, ro nicely rotating. Um, then you've got a galactic thick disk where you know it's much hotter than the thin disk, much, much larger velocity dispersion, um, and uh, it's significantly more metal poor. So it's, it's moderate metallicity, metallicity is near minus half or so, um, and alpha enriched compared to the alpha poor thin disk, which is more metal rich. And then on the outskirts, you've got the stellar halo. And the stellar halo is primarily metal poor, uh, very alpha rich, although there is an alpha poor component to it as well. Um, you know, and uh, there is also a debate about these components. So, um, you know, my PhD advisor, Jerry Gilmore, Gilmore and Reed, discover, was one of the discoverers of the galactic thick disk of the galaxy. That was only in the 80s. Um, and since then, there's been a lot of debate about, okay, does the Milky Way actually have a thin disk and thick disk, or is it just one disk? Um, even as recent as like 2012, 2014, there's, was, there were um, articles going around in the literature saying there is no thick disk, actually. Um, and then the stellar halo, for example, you know, there's uh, this constant debate about whether the stellar halo is an inner halo or an outer halo, where there's a dual halo with an inner component and an outer component, and whether it has in situ and accreted. And, and of course, there's tons and tons and tons of literature out there. I've just put, you know, some of the few uh, sources here, but there's tons and tons of literature about these various components in the Milky Way. And I point out that there's a debate in these components because when I was an undergraduate um, at Ohio University, um, I was told at that time, uh, back in 2000 and, you know, 2011, 2012, that, um, you know, eff effectively galactic astronomy was a solved problem. You know, we knew what the galactic components were. We knew how stars, we know how stars work. It's classical theory. It's all done. And the, oh, there's only two problems left. There's, um, you know, cosmology and there's exoplanets. And that's like the two big fields in astronomy left. And then I went to Europe for my PhD and realized, okay, that there's actually a lot more being done in stars. And there's a lot of really interesting work being done on, on, on the galaxy and galactic structure. And I really got interested. Um, this is where I kind of really got interested in the Milky Way as a whole. Um, so this is essentially how we think the Milky Way is structured. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why we think it's structured and the different chemical reasons for why we think it's structured this way. And I'll kind of delve into some of the debates about this structure and, and use chemical arguments to uh, walk my way through some of that stuff. Um, but uh, so the best way to start this, of course, is to remind everyone um, how the universe evolves chemically over time. Um, so this is kind of a nice image uh, from Anna Frabel, um, which effectively um, kind of nicely, succinctly in one slide kind of puts together chemical, uh, chemical evolution. Um, and so essentially you have the Big Bang, of course, at the beginning of the universe, and you get hydrogen, helium, and trace amounts of lithium from that. Um, that forms your first generation of stars, your, your so-called population three stars, your metal free stars. Um, and these stars are, you know, no one has ever seen one, so we don't really know what they look like. We know that they had had to exist, had to have had to existed because there is a first generation of stars for sure, uh, but we just don't really know what their properties are. Um, there's a lot of theoretical work that's being done on that, but we've never really observed a population three star. So observationally, we have no constraint. Um, and these stars are thought to be fairly massive and metal free and they explode or they, you know, go supernova or hypernova or whatever and explode and disperse all of their nucleosynthetic guts that they formed, all the elements that they formed, they disperse that into the interstellar medium. And um, in addition to that, uh, you also have, um, you know, from the second generation of stars, you have fairly massive stars that die very quickly, they go type 2 supernovae. They disperse into the interstellar medium things, the first set of elements, which are the are primarily the alpha elements. These are uh, things that are formed by helium capture. That's why they're called alpha elements. Um, and they're things like magnesium and silicon and calcium and oxygen and sulfur. So these are some of the first elements that kind of come out of your stars because these are 
these come out at very short time scales. Uh, and then of course, that polluted material creates a new generation of stars, that new generation of stars form population two stars. Um, they live, they die, they explode. And this whole process continues in a cycle. Um, and in addition to that, you also have as low mass stars are evolving um, more and more, you have white dwarfs that are appearing that can form your first set of type 1a supernovae. The type 1a is produced primarily iron and iron peak element or disperse at least type, um, iron and iron peak elements. So iron, nickel, cobalt, manganese, this kind of stuff. And so then you get your iron and nickels and cobalts. Um, and then in addition to that, at later times, you also get neutron star, neutron star mergers or other very, very, ex, um, explode, uh, very energetic explosions, uh, which can then form your even heavier R and S process, primarily your R process elements, uh, things like um, europium and, and gold and so forth. Um, and then of course you have the AGB stars in between, somewhere in between all of this, that's, that's also producing your heavier S process elements as well. So this is kind of a time, in terms of time scale, the first things that come out are the alpha elements. Then you've get, then you know, a gig a year or so after the, in, the, in terms of delay, you get your, your iron and iron peak elements. Um, I think someone has a question. Yeah, Keith, yeah, there is a question from the audience, indeed. Hi, just a naive question, Jeremy Goodman. Um, Surely, if there were any subsolar mass stars formed in population three, they would still be around. Uh, so, what's the argument that like ultra metal poor stars can't be population three? Do they still have traces of europium or something that rule that out? So, most of the most of the stars that we know of are uh, that are that that low metallicity also are carbon and extremely carbon enriched. Um, as well as some of them are enriched in the in the R process elements. These are called R process stars, um, and you know uh, these are probably these would be the things like you know metallicities of minus three, minus four that are R process enriched that are probably not um, population three stars. There's one detection I think of a star that was metallicity minus seven or so, and that would be one of your prime candidates for a low mass population three star. But there hasn't been very many detections of those. So I think there's only one known case of that with this near minus minus seven or so um, in metallicity. And that was there was a nature paper about that, I think two or three years ago. Um, but yeah, I hope that helps answer your question. Good. Okay, um, okay so um, so this this cartoon picture is a kind of a nice way of thinking about galactic chemical evolution and the, the tool that, that galactic archaeologists really, really love to use, um, although I think this tool is overused, is the alpha metallicity diagram. And so this is, if you read any galactic archaeology papers, you're probably going to see this diagram in it somewhere. Um, and this, this diagram shows the iron, the metallicity on the y axis, on the x-axis, and this is the iron to hydrogen ratio and normalized to the sun. So the sun is at zero. It's a logarithmic. Um, and so that means that minus one is one-tenth the iron content of the sun, minus two is one of the one-hundredth the iron content of the sun, and so forth. On the y-axis, you have the alpha to iron ratio of the star, where again, it's, it's relative to the sun. So zero is the same amount as, as the sun. Um, now, remember that the oldest stars in the galaxy are going to be metal poor because they haven't really been enriched by many supernovae. Um, and so they have, they're going to be primarily enriched by type two supernovae only because uh, you know, these are the ones that, these are the supernovae that happen at the, you know, the fastest the, the, on the shortest time scales. And so you're going to be enriched in alpha because you already, you've been polluted by type, the gas has been polluted by type twos. It's going to be relatively poor in iron because it's been polluted by type two, not type 1a, which produces more iron. Type twos um, do produce some iron, but type 1a's produce a lot more, essentially. Um, and so you have, you start out with your oldest stars having relatively high alpha to iron ratios and relatively low metallicities. Over time, you get more and more type twos going off. You build up your iron stock uh, and your gas, you move um, rightward in this diagram. And then about a gig a year or so after, well, that's still debated, a gig a year or so after the type twos start going off, you finally start to get type 1a supernovae. And those type 1as begin to produce lots and lots of iron. You then dilute your alpha to iron ratio, and that's how you get a knee in the alpha metal planets. Um, and the, the different components of the galaxy have different age distributions and therefore different distributions in this alpha over iron metallicity space as well. So the halo is up here, um, alpha enriched and metal poor. Um, the thick disk is here. It's fairly metal poor, but alpha rich because it's fairly old. Then you've got the thin disk, it's much younger, it's alpha poor and metal rich. 
And then you also have this accreted halo component, um, which is alpha pore and metal pore. And what's important there is that um, the dwarf galaxy environment or slower chemical evolution environments um, generally at a constant metallicity will have lower alpha to iron. And that's kind of important for this talk because that's how people have discovered accreted material, material that is accreted onto the Milky Way by low mass systems. So if you look at low mass systems in this alpha to metallicity, uh, alpha metallicity plane, these at a constant metallicity, low mass systems will have lower alpha. And the reason for that is because they have um, lower, they have uh, lower star formation rates, therefore they have less type two supernovae, therefore they have less uh, alpha enrichment comparative to a high mass system like the Milky Way that has far more type two supernovae and far more production of alpha elements and therefore has significantly higher alpha to iron ratio. Okay, so this plane is very, very useful for uncovering where dwarf galaxy material or material coming from low mass systems may come from. Um, okay, so then we have these different components in the Milky Way, you know, the thinnest, the thickest, the halo, the bulge. And so my group at UT, the Galactic Archaeology Group, the Galactic Archaeology Lab, um, primarily works at the intersection of these various components of the galaxy. Um, and it's, you know, I have something like four PhD students and a postdoc and, you know, six undergrad students. So kind of a, a build, slight, starting to build somewhat of a larger group here at, at UT. And so some of the questions that my group tries to address are things like, how did the Milky Way come to be? How does its various components form? How did the bulge form, for example? How did the disk form? Is the halo forming from primarily accretion from one massive system, or is it forming from in situ material from a pre-existing disk that got heated up, um, for example? What are the key physical processes that govern galaxy formation? What are the time scales involved in galaxy formation? How can we use stars as better tracers? And how can we improve upon the tools of galactic archaeology, like things like chemical tagging to answer these up, up questions above? Okay, so these are large number of questions that I, you know, keep me up at night or, um, you know, observing at the very least um, and keeping me kind of going in astronomy. And, and the reason why I enjoy astronomy so much is because these questions are really exciting and there are some answers to them, but there also are lots and lots of open questions um, within the sub questions within these kind of much broader questions. Of course, I only have time to talk about one or two of these today, um, you know, since I only have a certain amount of time. Um, but these are the kinds of questions that I like to ask and I like to kind of try to figure answers out for. Um, and part of the reason why I got interested in, in answering those particular questions is because um, we're kind of entering, we, you know, just as I was coming up as a PhD student, we were entering this, this big data era in galactic archaeology. So um, as I was going through my PhD and now as, as I'm a faculty member, there were these um, wonderful surveys, large spectroscopic surveys, that were either coming online or ongoing that were collecting spectra for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of stars at a time. And with those spectra, you can not only measure radial velocities, but you can also measure detailed chemical abundances. And this is great because you can measure something like up to 25 different elemental abundances for 100,000 stars, which gives you an enormous amount of data um, to really try to understand how the galaxy is structured and how it's been chemically evolving over time. Um, in addition to that, there was the, the Gaia spacecraft, um, which is pictured here, and Gaia um, was coming online uh, at, at around the same time. And so Gaia was a uh, European Space Agency mission. It was called the Billion Star Surveyor. It was goals was to produce the most precise 3D map of the galaxy to ever attempted by humans by getting parallaxes and proper motions, so astrometric information for something like um, a billion stars. And then in addition to that, they were also going to do uh, radio velocities for the kind of the brightest or so um, something like uh, 10 million stars or something like that. Um, and this was, uh, this was this incredibly revolutionary, revolutionary uh, mission. And in fact, I think when I started my PhD in 2013, everybody said, Gaia is going to revolutionize galactic astronomy. It's going to completely change the game. And the reason for that was because, you know, if you imagine, right, this is the Milky Way and you imagine that this is where the sun is, of course the sun isn't really there, but let's say that it's two thirds of the way out um, before Gaia, you know, before 2013, all of the kind of the detailed information that we knew about the structure of the galaxy came from very precise parallaxes from the Hipparchos mission, which was the nearest roughly 100,000 stars. And, um, you know, we were in a very small local volume where we had detailed, very precise parallaxes where we can actually do structure in kinematics and combine that with the chemistry. Gaia, of course, gets us from this small little bubble to a much, much, much larger um, volume uh, to the, you know, 
to a billion stars, not just 100,000. Um, so we you know, got parallaxes for something like an order of a couple orders of magnitude more in terms of the number of stars. And so when you combine Gaia with these large spectroscopic surveys together, you suddenly had a regime where you had 3D positions, 3D velocities. So you had entire 60 phase space and 25 elemental abundances for a large sample of stars. And that, um, that was such an exciting, that, that, that data set is incredibly exciting because now you have an enormous amount of data with which you can piece together the structure of the galaxy. Um, for those who aren't following Gaia, um, so Gaia's first data release, Gaia was launched in 2013, first data release is in 2016, second data release was April 2018, and the third data release, the early data release for the third uh, data release will actually be December 3rd of this year, December 3rd, 2020. Um, and the DR3 will be sometime in 2022. I think there's some delays due to coronavirus, but um, you know they're, they're kind of trucking along with the data. Gaia actually, instead of getting parallaxes for 1 billion stars, they got you know 600 million more by accident. They have 1.6 billion stars and the newest data release will have 1.8 billion stars in it in EDR3. Um, and Gaia was also this, this you know, for me, it was, a, it was a very big part of my career because I started my PhD when Gaia was launched in 2013. I finished my PhD in 2016 when the first data release happened and I became a postdoc at Columbia or, uh, as a Simons fellow. And then I became a faculty member uh, in, um, sorry, I became a postdoc in 2016 through for the first data release when I finished my PhD. And then in 2018, I became a faculty member. Um, so I kind of, every stage of my career has kind of followed at some level the data releases of Gaia. Um, quick warning about Gaia, for those of you who don't use Gaia on a regular basis, um, we're often taught in our astronomy classes to invert the parallax, which is what Gaia actually measures. You can invert the parallax to get the distance to a star. The Gaia team um, largely has said, don't do that. And the reason is because of error analysis. If your parallaxes, if you have Gaussian errors in parallax space, when you invert the parallax to get the distance, it becomes non-Gaussian, the PDF becomes non-Gaussian. And so you wind up um, getting a, like, for example, if you have 50% parallax, if you have 50% uncertainty in the parallax error, this is the distance, this is the PDF of the distance, one divided by the parallax. And you wind up with a very skewed distribution so that if you take, if you try to get um, an estimator of that, you end up getting a, a biased result. So you want to be very careful about just na naively inverting parallaxes, um, especially when error bars for parallaxes get large. Okay, so that covers all the background. And the remaining bit of the talk will be um, on the various projects that my group is doing in the various components of the galaxy. So basically what I'll be doing for the rest of the talk is going component by component, um, saying what my group is doing in each of these components. Because I have what my group is doing is essentially we're working in all the various components of the galaxy. We have little projects here and there in each one of these components to really try to understand one aspect of that particular component. Um, I won't go into extreme amounts of detail about any one project. Um, that'll leave for, if you have any questions, you can ask me during the Q&A period, or um, you can set up a one-on-one -on -one with me, or, um, you know, or you know, shoot me an email offline. But I wanted to do it this way because I want to try and give you a flavor for what, I'm, for what my group is working on in case there are any kind of collaboration uh, links that can be made. So I see this colloquium as a chance for me to not only talk about what I do, but also a chance uh, to see um, if there are any collaborations that can be built between Texas and Princeton um, and IAS, uh, at least my group. Um, <clears throat> so I'll start uh, my the rest of this talk with the galactic thin disk, since that's where we kind of live. So we'll start in your home um, in the galactic thin disk, and I'll talk about this idea of what, what we call chemical tagging in, astron in, in galactic astronomy, galactic archaeology, and how we can use chemical tagging to solve questions about for example, the assembly history of the galactic disk, as well as the nature of some of the fastest stars in the galaxy. So um, chemical tagging is this very simple idea um, that came about in the early 2000s by uh, Freeman and Bland Hawthorne. And the idea basically says that, um, let's imagine that you have two gas clouds that are separ in, separated in different parts of the galaxy. And those gas clouds, one is metal rich and magnesium poor, and the other one's iron rich, iron poor and magnesium rich. So they have different chemistry. Um, those star forming regions, of course, create stars. And then over time, those, those gas clouds dissipate um, due to stellar winds and all kinds of other diffusive processes. And then um, the stars in those uh, it, that are kind of form in these, in these groups or associations or clusters 
loosely bound structures basically get dispersed and phase mixed throughout the galaxy as they orbit around the galaxy. So they get kind of completely jumbled up. And the question that chemical tagging asks is, can we unjumble this? Can we, can we basically figure out where that all of the orange stars were born together and all the blue stars were born together using their chemical fingerprints? And so that means if you take a spectrum of star one and you know the one blue star and one orange star in this in this kind of cartoon, you can study their detailed chemistry and realize, ah, they weren't chemically alike. And so they probably weren't born together. But if I take a spectrum of two blue stars, they have exactly the same chemistry and therefore they were born together. And so by doing this, we can actually identify where, where exactly in the galaxy things were born. Okay, so this is an extremely powerful technique because if it works, then it means that we can reconstruct the entire assembly history of the galaxy. We can tell you where every star in the galaxy, where it was born, um, and in which cluster it was born in. And then we, from that, we can backtrack and use, say, orbit integration. We can backtrack and figure out then, you know, how long it took to phase mix or how, you know, we can identify where things are coming from. So it's an extremely, extremely powerful technique if it, if it works. Um, the question is, does it actually work? Does chemical tagging work? Um, and so there are really two assumptions, underlying assumptions to chemical tagging. The first is that stars that are born together from the same cloud of gas need to be chemically homogeneous, right? Because you're using the, the chemical fingerprint of the star as essentially its DNA, okay? And the second assumption is that stars that are born in separate spaces, born apart, have to be chemically distinct from each other so that you can distinguish one star group born in one location and another star group born somewhere else. So these are the two underlying critical and key assumptions of chemical tagging. So it's like asking this question, if asking the question, does chemical tagging work, is really asking the question, um, are stars born together chemically homogeneous or not? If the answer to that question is yes, um, then chemical tagging can work. Um, and if the answer is no, then chemical tagging can't. Uh, but in addition to that, this question is a really important one because um, it's how we actually do exotic star characterization. So when I say exotic star, I just mean non-FGK stars because I spent most of my time thinking about FGK stars. Um, but for example, M dwarfs are extraordinarily difficult or notoriously difficult um, to model. They're notoriously difficult to get derived stellar properties from in, in chemical abundances because we don't have a very good handle on uh, molecular opacities. This is one area where I think that astronomy needs a lot of work is in laboratory astrophysics. There's not a lot of laboratory astrophysics going on. Um, there's, there's very few groups that do it, but it's extremely critical because it underpins all of our, our chemical stellar chemical abundances and our stellar properties work. Um, but M dwarfs are a good example of where this is a problem because we don't really have good uh, handle on molecular opacities. So we don't have a good handle on the chemical abundances or the stellar parameters of M dwarfs. And so what people normally do is they find an M dwarf in a wide binary pair with or a binary pair with a, um, an FGK star that's a little bit easier to analyze. And they make the assumption that the M dwarf has the same chemistry as whatever it's in a pair with, i.e. things born together are chemically homogeneous. Um, and so that, of course, is very important for things like the exoplanet community that's prime, that is largely looking at M dwarfs. This is also true for white dwarfs. White dwarfs are, are obviously very hard because they're very they're extremely hot. They've ionized most of their lines away. Um, and you just have extremely broad features. Sometimes you can find um, heavy elemental lines in, in, in white dwarfs. But again, they're characterized often by being in a pair with a, another star. Um, so if the answer to this question is yes, then everything is good. We can keep doing what we're doing. Chemical tagging can work, great. If the answer to this is no, then we're actually in quite a lot of trouble because not only will chemical tagging not work and it will be harder to reconstruct the assembly history of the galaxy, but in addition to that, the way that we're doing exotic star characterization also won't work either. And so this is a very important question. Now there's a wonderful test case done um, by Semyong Oh um, back when um, I was actually, so Semyong Oh was a Princeton grad student at the time in 2017 and I was at, at Columbia, but I, you know, we were constantly, I was constantly going to the Flatiron Institute um, as it was starting up and Semyong was there and, and presented this really awesome work where she showed um, this wide binary pair. She went out looking for co-moving pairs in Gaia DR1. Uh, John Brewer happened to have um, very high resolution observations of, of several of these pairs and they, the chemistry of the pairs are shown, the chemistry of one of these pairs of stars is shown 
Um, here in this plot on the y-axis, you have the x over h ratio, um, again, normalized to the sun. So zero is the same amount as the sun. And on the x-axis, you have the different various elements. The red star is one of the stars in the pair, and the blue star is its companion. Now, if these stars were indeed chemically homogeneous at birth, then they should, then the blue line and the red line should overlap. This is saying, uh-oh, we have a real serious problem because this is showing us that, in fact, in this Kronos Krios pair, the iron abundances, for example, for these stars, the iron to hydrogen ratio, the metal content are different by 0.2 dex, which is quite large. And in fact, in, in a large number of the heavier uh, kind of refractory elements, I think they, they, you actually do see enhancements in one of the star compared to the other. So this is a problem because this already says, well, maybe chemical tagging can't work because stars born together are not chemically homogeneous. And that's one of the underlying assumptions of chemical tagging. Um, and so there's a lot of work that's been done on this. Um, will chemical tagging work? Will it not? Um, you know, I've worked on this and written a couple papers on this, but there's been a lot of work done on this. So that's why I put the dot, dot, dots on either side um, of, of kind of some of the, 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 um, the citations here. Um, but the, the general consensus, I think, at the moment is that there's two flavors of chemical tagging. There's weak chemical tagging, where you can tag an individual star to which component of the galaxy it comes from. That does work and can work. But the strictest form of chemical tagging, the strong form of chemical tagging, which is you can identify the exact birth cluster. That is not yet clear if it can work. But answering this question, are things born together, um, identical, chemically identical or not, will help us figure that, that whether or not that strict chemical tagging can actually, can actually work. So my group, when I arrived at Austin, what we did was we wrote a proposal to get um, McDonald Observatory time, which is pictured here on the, on the left. Um, we have our 2.7 meter telescope out at McDonald and I got high resolution spectra for something like 25 wide binary pairs just to see if this Kronos Krios result that Simon O found, is this common? Is this, is this something that's, that's common in, or, or not? So we, went out, we observed you know, 25 wide binary pairs um, and we you know, were looking to see whether they were identical or not. Um, you know, this is just showing uh, the CMD of those wide binary pairs. And for the uh, spectroscopists in the room, this is showing the actual spectra of those wide binary pairs. You can already, so one of the, this is four different pairs um, in black, one pair in red, one pair in orange, and one pair in, in kind of magenta. And the solid line is one of the pairs and the dotted line is its companion. And you can see from most of these, you see absolutely no differences. It's very hard spectroscopically to see any differences between some of these pairs. In a few of the pairs, you can see lined up differences, but in most of the pairs, you don't see anything. Um, I think I see another question. Sorry, same culprit. Um, you, you mentioned uh, settling is normally not an issue, but I, I want, I, with the F stars, where the where the surface convection zone goes away, um, you know, theory would predict that there should be settling in the absence of rotational mixing and things. So I wonder, in the cases where there were chemical differences, was one of them an F star, or, or was it what are the spectral types generally of these wide pairs? Um, they're normally FGK pairs, and one thing that we did explicitly in this particular study, and I think uh, Siming O also did this, but this. This varies from study to study. One thing that we did was we tried to make sure that the pairs had very similar temperatures. They were very similar spectral types. And so you'd expect that both of them would actually, if there was any gravitational settling, both of them would have the same, roughly the same amount of settling that you would find in it. So they were roughly equal mass, roughly effect, same effective temperature, roughly the same gravities um, to kind of account for things like that. It's also good to, for them to have similar temperatures and gravity, surface gravities because it minimizes any level of systematics that are induced by your code as well. Um, so what we find is that uh, we, we found a couple of pairs, like something like 10% of our pairs were not chemically homogeneous, even though they were of basically the same spectral type. But in 90% of the cases, we find spectral spectra that look like this, where there's no differences at all. And this, this, is that, this is that summary plot that I wanted to show, which shows you the, um, the dispersion of the difference in the X over H ratio. That dispersion should be zero. Of course, it's not zero because we have measurement uncertainty. Um, so the measurement uncertainty is being shown here in, in circles, black circles. The red triangles are showing you um, the typical dispersions, the, 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 the dispersion and the difference that we're seeing across the wide binaries. Um, so we, what we find is that we don't, in most elements, we don't find 
any um, measurable uh, dispersion um, or measurable difference, if you will, uh, in the um, chemical abundances of the various uh, for wide binaries. We do find that, however, when we take random pairs of field stars, we find significant differences in their abundance ratios. Um, and this is expected, right? The field is very, if you just take random field stars, they look very different chemically. But if you take wide binaries, they look extraordinarily homogeneous. 10% um, of the cases we find that they're not homogeneous. Why they're not homogeneous is still relatively unknown to us. And that's something that we need to do a little bit more work on, I think. Um, the primary culprits that seem to be the case uh, would be things that, that have come out in the literature are things like gravitational settling, which can have differences at the 0 0.05 dex level or so. Um, but the differences we're seeing are closer to like 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2 dex. These differences are thought to be potentially planet engulfment um, scenarios. And so this is work done by Samyang Oh, Ivan Ramirez, Jorge Melendez, and, and groups like that. Keith, um, yep. we have another question, please. Uh, oh. review. Yes, Keith, uh, what's the definition of Y binary? So what's the separation typically? Uh, generally, for these wide binaries that we were studying, there's their three separations are less than 2,000 to 10,000 AU. Um, at some point, we go away from wide binaries. And I'm going to say that in a moment. We're going to actually go away from wide binaries and move into extremely wide co-moving pairs. So there's a slight terminology difference of wide binary versus co-moving pair. OK, thank you. Yep. Um, so we wrote this paper um, about the wide binaries, uh, or sorry, co-moving co pairs, essentially, or wide binaries. Um, in this case, these were up to 10,000 AU, not beyond um, 10,000 AU in 3D separations. Um, and uh, we basically find that in 90% of the cases, they're identical. And I liked you know, the, the press got a kick out of this because this is work done, I should say, with, with my graduate student, Drea Carrillo and Maddie Lucy, as well as undergraduates, Megan and Dustin. Um, but I, the, the press really liked this because I'm actually a twin. I, I'm a fraternal twin, but I got to study whether stars are, are chemically fraternal or identical. So that that's a, a picture of me and my twin with the press release. Um, my student, Tyler Nelson, is actually going a step further and expanding this into beyond just co-moving uh, wide binaries to expanded into co-moving pairs. And so um, this is just showing a collection of samples that we have. Um, Tyler is actually extending this work from you know, 10 to 4, 10 to 5 AU all the way out to 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 AU, which is something like a few parsecs, right? These are no longer really wide binaries because they're not really bound anymore. They're co-moving pairs or pairs of stars that are moving together. And what we're finding is that by and large, um, we don't really see a significant difference so this is showing you the difference in the Fe over H, the difference in the metallicity as a function of separation. That difference is zero, of course, if you have a homogeneous, if it, everything is homogeneous. And you get some dispersion around zero, of course, if, because of measurement uncertainty. And so what we're finding is a very slight increase in the dispersion of the difference in metallicity um, of the two wide binary or the two co-moving pairs, the, the two stars in the pair. Um, as you go to, to very large parsec level separations. But in fact, not, very, not by much. We're finding that things are fairly homogeneous, even co-moving pairs are fairly homogeneous, even up to separations of 20 or 30 or 40 parsecs, which, is, which was at first quite surprising. But um, there was simulation work done by Harshal Kamdar uh, and Charlie Conroy's group that kind of predicts that this may be the case, that things may be homogeneous out to about 100, out to about 100 parsecs or so. So we're, we currently, um, this, is, this is work that's uh, in preparation, just getting rid of, written up now. And then we're planning on extending this out to the 100 parsec or 300 parsec level, just to see uh, where we start to see a significant rise in the uh, dispersion and the difference in the metallicities. So chemical tagging, the, the key behind this is that chemical tagging probably can work. Um, it's, it's encouraging that, that, this, that we're seeing um, very high levels of homogeneity, even out to wide separations. Um, so at least what we think is that chemical tagging probably can work. Um, it's still kind of an open question. Keith, uh, there was a question about one member of the uh, audience uh, uh, about if the sigma on the y-axis at the bottom is just the measurement error or something else. Yeah, the sigma is just the measurement error. It's just the internal measurement error right now. That's why this is still labeled as preliminary. Um, we need to replace this with the total measurement error. Um, right now, it's just the internal, just accounting for the line by line uncertainties. But in fact, there are uncertainties that are related to the um, 
related to the fact that the the stellar parameters themselves, the temperature, gravity, and so forth, microturbulent velocities also have uncertainties. So that needs to be accounted for. So this is kind of a, a plot that's going to be remade in, in, a, in a couple, hopefully in, in a week or two for the, for the paper. Uh, but I'm just waiting on that. But I, I did want to say something about this, primarily because I want to mention that we're, we're going to much larger, much, much, much larger uh, separations. OK. OK, so now what can we do with chemical tagging um, now that we know that it possibly can work. Um, one of the things that I did um, back a couple of years ago with Rosie Wise, uh, now that I'm still working on now, is um, applying chemical, this idea of chemical tagging to some of the fastest stars in the galaxy. And I have an NSF grant that, that kind of focuses on this. And these stars are called hypervelocity stars. They're thought to be produced by uh, a triple body encounter between a binary pair of stars near the galactic center and the supermassive black hole, this red dot at the galactic center. One star gets captured by the black hole and the other star gets ejected at an enormously high velocity, a thousand or so, a thousand or more kilometers per second and get ejected that they're moving so fast they're unbound to the Milky Way. Um, and so this is called the Hills mechanism and was talked about theoretically by Jake Hills and I think in 1988. Then they were theoretically, they were observationally found by Warren Brown in like 2005 or so. And um, since that time, there's been a lot more discoveries of potentially, of potential hypervelocity star candidates and in addition to that, um, there was, there's been several arguments in literature um, from Douglas Bourbeau and others who are stating that maybe some of these um, hypervelocity stars can come from the large Magellanic Cloud, not the, not the center of the galaxy, just based on where they're located on the sky and what their motions appear to be. Um, and so to settle this debate, are, are, you know, are these hypervelocity stars coming from the center of the galaxy or are they coming from the large Magellanic Cloud? One can actually take a chemical tagging approach to this. And the reason, for that is if we go back to that alpha metallicity plane that I talked about earlier, the, um, the halo of our galaxy looks like this, the thick disk looks like this, the thin disk looks like this. Now the galactic center is, is got an extraordinarily high star formation rate early on. And so it's, it has an enormously high metallicity as well as relatively enriched in the alpha elements. Whereas the LMC is, a dwarf, is a, effectively a dwarf galaxy. It's a low mass galaxy, lower mass than the Milky Way at least. And so its chemical abundance pattern in this alpha metallicity plane is much lower. It's got, at, a, at any given metallicity, it's got a much lower alpha to iron ratio. And so if these hypervelocity stars are coming from the LMC, then they should be drawn from this gray line. And if they're coming from the galactic center, they should be drawn from this black line. So we went out, Rosie and I went out and we looked for, you know, we found some hypervelocity stars that were discovered in candidates that were discovered in uh, Gaia DR2. This is the Marchetti et al. 2018 work. We got high resolution spectra from Apache Point. We chemically tagged them. And the most important diagram here is the calcium. If you look at the, um, the so the, the, this is the, the galactic disk in gray, the LMC in orange, and the galactic halo in kind of pink and blue from various different literature sources. If you look at calcium, the black symbols are our five um, hypervelocity star candidate stars. These are stars that are moving at five to 600 kilometers per second. They're quite fast. Um, almost unbound, if not unbound. These are FGK stars. And what we're finding is that some of these hypervelocity star candidates are not coming from the galactic center because they should be somewhere over here, enriched in the alpha and enriched in metal and iron. They're also not coming from the LMC because they should be relatively metal poor and relatively alpha poor. We're finding that they're actually metal poor and enriched in the alpha. They look like run of the mills halo stars. And so this, what this indicates is that some of the hypervelocity star candidates that are being discovered in Gaia DR2 are not actually coming from the galactic center. They're not actually coming from the large Magellanic cloud. They're just typical halo stars. And so what we think is happening is that some of these stars, these hypervelocity star candidates, some of them are in fact just the highest velocity tail end of the, um, the stellar halo distribution, the stellar halo velocity distribution. And so we're going to have to do a little bit more work. Um, and so we're pushing back on, on the discoverers of these hypervelocity stars to do a little bit more work to try and um, you know, figure out if they're actually unbound. Are they actually truly hypervelocity? Are they not truly hypervelocity or not? Um, and so this is, this is work. We have an ongoing survey of these hypervelocity star candidates. There's something like 100. We've now observed something like 25 or 30 of them. So we're, we're slowly creeping up and getting our numbers up. And uh, we're planning on hopefully um, writing up a publication on this uh, in the near future, um, focusing on the detailed chemistry of hypervelocity stars in Gaia DR2. Um, just want to talk about some other work that we're doing in the galactic disk. This is the primarily thin disk, although also the thick disk. 
is um, looking at these relatively young stellar streams in the galactic disk that are being discovered in Gaia DR2. So what people are finding are these, um, these so if you look at the velocity distribution in the nearby galaxy, in the nearby, you know, galaxy, uh, you find that there are some overdensity. So this is V5 as a function of VR for the galactic disk, and then just the nearby disk, um, things I think within a few hundred parsecs, maybe a kiloparsec or so, um, there are some overdensities, and these overdensities are generally structures or substructures that are being found in the galactic disk. And one, sub, one such substructure found by uh, MindGas in 2019 was this uh, Pisces Aridonis stream. When they looked at this stream, it was, a, it was a stream of stars in the galactic disk, not to be confused with stellar streams in the halo. That's part of what grabbed my attention to this is I'm used to thinking about stellar streams of stars as being elongated strings of, star, strings of stars in the galactic halo from stuff that's getting stretched out to, to the tides. This is actually very, um, you know, long streams. This is a 400 parsec long stream in the galactic disk. It's very young. It's something like 100 million years. Um, it's, a, it's, it's extraordinarily long, and it's even got these overdensities in the stream. And I got interested in this partly because I'm interested in potentially how do these things form, whether stars are forming in clusters or forming along filaments. And the primary reason why I'm interested in this is goes back to this chemical tagging question, which is um, if stars are formed in these long filaments, then the, the likelihood of having chemical inhomogeneities rises compared to if they're formed in these really dense, uh, relatively small, kind of spherical like structures, right? And so that's part of why we got interested in this. Um, the, you know, the original mine gas paper did an isochrone fit and found that the stream was only about, it was, it was about a gig year old, but then there was a debate that started because Jason Curtis came back and measured rotation ages. So this is rotation periods of stars in the Pisciaridonis stream, this, this stream of stars um, in red as a function of stellar temperature. And um, what you're seeing here is the rotation ages for uh, the Pleiades, 120 million years in blue, 670 million years Precipi in cyan, and the gig year old NGC 6811 in orange. And so if the thing was actually gig year, then the rotation ages should be all the red uh, stars should actually be drawn from essentially this distribution up here. But in fact, they looked a lot younger. They only were about 100 million years. And this really increases the, the interest in this particular stream of stars, because if this is correct, then these, this is this as a very, very close, it's like a hundred parsecs close stream, it's only a hundred million years old. So it's like a Pleiades analog um, that, you know, people were finding. And so uh, I actually went out and chemically characterized the stream, not only to identify if it's homogeneous, again, going back to this, are stars born together homogeneous question, but also we can actually look at lithium as an abundance tracer to see if the thing is actually hundred million years old or a gig year old. And so that's what we did. We went out and looked at the stream chemically to see if it's homogeneous. And we went out to look to see if, if we can find lithium enhancements to see if it was actually young. Um, the results of that was published earlier this year showing that the stream is actually fairly homogeneous. It's, uh, got, we have a dispersion in the abundance of iron of about 0.04 dex, so fairly homogeneous. Um, in addition to that, we also showed that it's extremely enriched in lithium as well. Um, and this confirmed its really young age of 120 million years, where if it was a gig year old, as mine gas initially indicated, then the black, which is this is the abundance in lithium that we're finding as a function of temperature of the star. Lithium, of course, gets mixed down over time and burned. That's the reason it gets dredged down and uh, convected down and burned. That's the reason why the, the, the depletion in lithium is an age indicator. Um, over time. And so uh, the black is showing you the Pisciaridonis stream, the red is the Pleiades, the or magenta is the Hyades, 600 million year old Hyades, and the gray is the galactic disk at a few giga year. And so if it really was a giga year old stream, you would expect the black to be somewhere down here. We find them significantly more enhanced, therefore it's lithium enriched. Interestingly, there's been a lot of discoveries coming out. So this is Conkle and Covey's work showing that they found something like, you know, hundreds of these new newly discovered extremely long, extremely young stellar streams, where these ages are something like 10 million years to, um, you know, a few million years to something like uh, 100 million years. And I have a graduate student, Catherine Meneas, who's actually doing this exact same thing that we did with Pisciaridonis, but with many, many, many more streams. And we're finding a, an enormous number of very young, extraordinarily young, like 100 million year old streams that are four, 500, 600 parsecs long, um, indicating that maybe these things 
maybe these 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 stars are actually forming along filaments, not in these kind of open cluster-like environments. Um, okay, so uh, with that, I'll move on to the galactic bulge and wrap up there, and then the rest of the talk uh, will be kind of siphoned to what I don't get to will be siphoned to the Bacall lunch, um, which will be um, you know I think at twelve thirty Eastern and eleven thirty here in here in Texas. Um, so I'll wrap up with just a couple of slides on what we're doing in the Galactic Bulge, and then I'll tell you what we're doing the Stellar Halo at the Bacall lunch with the HEPEX survey. Um, so my group is also working in the Galactic Bulge. It's an incredibly alpha-rich component, incredibly metal-rich component. It's very old, but it's got an enormously high star formation rate. That's why it's both alpha-rich and metal-rich at the same time. And so I have a student that's been working on um, finding the most metal-poor stars in the Bulge, and the reason why we're interested in these metal poor bulge stars, you know, it's, it's, they're hard to find because the bulge is so metal rich that it's a needle in the haystack kind of problem. But the reason why we're so interested in it is based on simulation work from Tomlinson et al, uh, 2010, which shows, you know, if you look at this, the galaxy, here in the background, I'm showing you uh, the fraction of stars, the fraction of extremely metal poor stars that were formed before Zia 15. So these are the oldest, oldest, oldest metal poor stars. And so um, this is basically the, the, the highest chance of finding a population three star is going to be looking for stars born before Zia 15 or that are also extremely metal poor. And a fraction of those stars, of extreme metal poor stars that were born before Zia 15, the highest fraction seems to be found in the galactic center rather than in the stellar halo. So if you wanna find population three remnants or things that have been polluted by only a population three star, then you want to look towards the center of the galaxy. So I have a student that's completing a, a large survey of, of um, uh, Maddie Lucy who's completing a large survey of the galactic center, primarily looking at metal poor stars in the galactic bulge. She's published two papers on this, looking at the origins of those stars. Um, the first paper was primarily interested in looking at the high resolution um, of detailed abundances of me extremely metal poor stars, so stars between minus one and minus three uh, in the galactic center. She, find, she found extremely enhanced calcium enrichment in those stars, which is indicative of um, potentially uh, parent stability supernovae, so that's still tentative. Uh, she also found evidence of um, potential globular cluster stars, uh, accreted material, or uh, dissolved globular cluster material in the galactic center using um, magnesium aluminum anticorrelation um, abundances. Um, and in addition to that, she's also looking now at the kinematics of those stars and just published some work on that. Um, looking at the detailed um, motions of those stars just to see how many of those metal poor stars are truly confined to the stellar bulge versus how many of those stars are actually interlopers from the, from the stellar halo. Um, I don't have time to talk about um, those in terms of plots, but I just wanted to mention them in case anyone's interested in that. I have plots that I can show, which kind of talks a little bit about some of the science highlights that I just mentioned. Um, with that, I kind of want to tell you um, where I think galactic archaeology is going. I think you know, my, my group is also working in the stellar halo. I don't have time to talk about that, so I'll just remove that and talk about that at the call lunch. But we're primarily interested in the stellar halo. We're primarily interested in um, the nature of this uh, one large massive system that it created, this Gaia Enceladus sausage system. So my group has been doing a lot of work on that. I've been interested in that for, for, for many years now. My group is doing a lot of work on that, and we're actually trying to now do a completely unbiased view of the stellar halo using the HEPEX low resolution spectroscopic survey, which I'll talk about at the call lunch. Um, but the final thing that I want to end with is where I think galactic archaeology is going in terms of trying to piece together the structure of the galaxy. And that is, I think that the, the next real step in galactic archaeology is doing really detailed chemical cartography work. Um, and cartography is basically map making. And so this idea, the final idea that I had was, you know, this, what I really envision is walking into, say, a planetarium, for example, color coding every star by its chemical fingerprint, say magnesium over iron. And then trying to use that map of the galaxy to, to figure out how it is structured and what structures pop out. So this is an example of that map that I've been able to do. This is, you can now actually see this map in the Hayden Planetarium. I worked with the Hayden Planetarium staff and Jack McFarity at AMNH. We, we combine Apogee data and Gala data and we um, have a, a simulated galaxy in the background here. Every star in this image is color coded. Every image, every color point in this, in this image is a, is a um, star colored by magnesium over iron from the surveys positioned in space by Gaia. And you can actually already see from this image alone the thin disk of the galaxy and the thick disk of the galaxy separating beautifully 
the thinnest being this blue patch here and the thickest being this kind of greenish patch here. And so you can already start to see structures in the galaxy. And doing cartography like this, I think, is, is really going to be the way forward uh, for trying to map out how the galaxy is structured, at least in a chemical way. And um, we're kind of now on the precipice of being able to do that with Gaia DR3 and other large spectroscopic surveys. So my final point really is just that uh, I think that the future is bright in galactic archaeology with all of these large spectroscopic surveys um, in addition to Gaia. So I'll open up for questions. Well, thank you very much, Keith, uh, for such an interesting and uh, energetic uh, presentation. So now we have uh, quite a number of uh, questions here. Uh, we'll start with uh, Bruce Drain. So beautiful talk. Thank you very much. Um, I, I must have missed something because you, you showed us the Kronos Krios pair with a significant difference. And then you went on to tell us that you found no evidence of difference in many in a large sample. So what is the Kronos Krios explanation? So that so the Kronos Krios explanation, if you the O paper basically says that um, the, their their argument was that the two stars are chemically inhomogeneous because one of the stars ate a rocky planet, basically. And we find that something like 10% of our sample, in addition, 10% of our sample, we also find inhomogeneities at the same level, 0 0.15, 0 0.2 dex. The explanation for the planets comes from the fact that there are certain set of elements that go into making planet cores that are enhanced, whereas other elements that don't go into planet cores, the CNO, for example, are not enhanced between the two stars. Um, so one star, this red star, for example, may have eaten a rocky planet that was formed of this, the silicates and the calciums and the titaniums and so forth that, that actually make the planet the planet's core. Um, so that's that's the explanation, at least, that they gave in their, in their study for why one star is enhanced and the other is not. Um, we did not give an exam, we did not give for the for the 10% or stars in our sample that we found, we did not give the same explanation because we don't see the same set of elements, the so-called refractories, I think it's refractories, uh, that are enhanced relative to the volatiles. Um, and so we didn't say planet accretion, we just said, here are the mechanisms that could cause this and it warrants future study because it's really hard to do unless we get a significantly higher resolution and we really study the detailed kind of in the detailed natures of these stars, essentially. Thank you. Hey, let's do next. I wonder if there's any prospect for using young star clusters that are still in the process of forming or just form to test chemical homogeneity? Or is it hopeless because of rapid rotation and activity and all these things that make interpreting the spectra harder? Uh, a little bit of both, actually. I think that there is some room still to be done there. I think that that's part of where we're going to need better models, better spectral models. Um, and this is part of the part of the point I was making about lab, you know, having more laboratory data um, to help us constrain the, the nature of those stars is going to be extraordinarily important for being able to interpret. Um, the challenge, of course, as you already mentioned with the, the youngest cases, is that things are rotating so rapidly that it's very hard to get a good picture of what's going on in the star. Um, we're trying to do this um, for stars that are at the 60 million to 100 million year time scale. And we, we find that we can do it, but only with a specific set of stars um, that are not rotating super rapidly. And that's, and that's also really challenging to do on the 2.7 meter class telescope. So uh, we're trying the best that we can, but uh, I think you're, the answer is we're gonna need better, better models in the future, better um, spectral models in order to actually solve rotation and activity so that we can actually interpret those spectra better. Thanks. Uh, Luke Boma. Hey, uh, thanks for this talk. Um, you mentioned for the Pisces Eridani work, the, the possibility that the star formation environment affects the, the chemical homogeneity of the cluster. Um, I'm wondering whether for, for Pisces Eridani specifically, whether the abundance dispersion that you saw was consistent with what you would have seen if it were just a normal open cluster or if it were maybe, you know, if it had a larger dispersion at all. So, um... Yeah, so these, if you have a very, very long stream, um, depending on what your mixing length scale is, you can get into a situation where one part of the stream is slightly different chemically than the other part of the stream. And so even though it's one structure, <laughs> it looks chemically different or there's a chemical dispersion across the structure. Um, for the Pisces or Don stream, it, uh, particularly, we did not see significant dispersion in most of the elements 
um, above, say, the, uh, above the, the total uncertainties um, for most of the elements across the stream. There was one element where we found something very, very tentative, and that was in silicon, where we had very, what we thought would be, what we, we thought we had pretty high precision on the, um, on the silicon values, but there is a very, very, very slight silicon trend um, across the stream, and I don't know if I put that plot in. I did not, so this is just showing iron. Um, we see a very, very slight silicon trend across the stream where this area is very slightly silicon enriched and this area is slightly, very, very slightly silicon poor. Um, but it was so, with only four, we only had 40 stars here. Um, we argued in the paper at the time that um, this is, you know, we see this tentative thing, but really what we really want to do is get many more stars and fill this area <laughs> in a lot more to really get a better idea. But for now, what, we, what we're claiming is that we don't see any very significant dispersion, so it's, it looks fairly similar to what we'd expect an open cluster, an open cluster to look like. Got it. Thanks. Next one is Renu Chen. Let's talk. Um, I have a, sort of three mini questions on, on the uh, chemical thing. So you, you mentioned briefly that there are stars at the center. They look like uh, uh, from former gravel clusters with uh, magnesium to aluminum and dark correlation. Do you have there to look at the sodium to oxygen correlation? And what's their typical F E over H? And are they uh, nitrogen enriched? Okay, um, all very good questions. So this is, again, stuff that I didn't have time to talk about, but here are the plots showing you um, the 26 or so metal poor stars that were in the galactic bulge that we got. Um, you're seeing those 26 stars here. Um, and in addition, you're seeing, for example, that they are running between metallicities of minus one and minus three. They have fairly high calcium enrichments. And if you look at the magnesium aluminum, these are the two stars or so. Uh, that have extremely high aluminum and fairly low magnesium, which would be indicative of globular cluster. Um, we wanted to look at the sodium oxygen, excuse me, the sodium oxygen anti-correlation as well. The problem is in metal poor stars, we had real trouble actually getting the oxygen abundances. We could not get the oxygen abundances um, because we did not have a sufficient quality of line. So we wanted to use the O1 trip, the O1 um, uh, forbidden line. Um, unfortunately, that O1 forbidden line was too noisy for us to get a good estimator of the oxygen. So that killed the ability to use the sodium oxygen anticorrelation. Um, in addition to that, nitrogen, we could not get nitrogen from these spectra because they were fairly, they were like signal noise of like 30, 40 um, in the optical. And it's very hard to do nitrogen abundances at that signal noise in the optical. Really, what you would want to do is go back and get those in the infrared and look at CN. Uh, to get the carbon and nitrogen, primarily to get the nitrogen abundances. So we weren't able, we were not able to get nitrogen as well uh, sufficiently. Okay, what's the question, Meta? Yeah, hi, Case. Beautiful talk. Uh, you mentioned the possibility of these uh, hypervelocity uh, halo stars. Uh, can you say something more about it? What type of velocities uh, would they have? And what does it tell us about? If, that, if those were the cases uh, about the mass of the galaxy? Yeah, so um, this is work that we did with, with Rosie Wise, or work that I did with Rosie Wise at Hopkins. And what we were finding was that the velocity, um, you know, so these are stars that are moving at like, it's somewhere between 530 to 580 kilometers per second. So near, this, near the local volume, that's uh, very similar to the escape speed of the Milky Way, or what we think the escape speed of the Milky Way is. Um, the argument that we made in this paper is that chemically, these stars look no different than the stellar halo. And so the option that you have here is you, uh, you have the option that these are truly unbound, but they're stellar halo stars. So they're, they're at the highest velocity tail of the stellar halo, and therefore they're unbound. They're, they're kind of the unbound tail of the halo. But the ar other argument that you have that you can make is that these things are actually just typical halo stars. They're just, they're bound to the Milky Way, which means you have to slightly rise the, um, the local escape speed. And in order to do that, you need to make the mass of the Milky Way just slightly heavier um, in order to do that as well. And so we, we presented those two options in the paper saying, you, you, these either are unbound and they're, they're, they're halo stars, they're extremely, you know, they're the, the, the very tail, or you have to slightly rise the mass of the Milky Way so that they're no longer unbound to the Milky Way. And if they're so. bound, what would be that higher mass of the Milky Way? So we didn't do that calculation, which we probably should have. Um, we just, at the time, I think 
Um, we just cited some work that some kind of early work that was being done in Gaia DR2, which was showing that the Milky Way might be heavier uh, based on the kinematics of globular clusters. Uh, but that is actually not a calculation that we did with which probably should have done. Are these stars also somewhat young for halo stars? Um, we don't think that they're super young. Uh, if you do isochrone matching, they're in the they're probably about ten or so or more years. The problem is, of course, age dating individual stars is an extremely challenging task. Um, what we're primarily interested in now is looking at the hottest types of stars that we can get chemistry for. So type maybe like F. Um, once you start getting above F, it, in the it just starts getting really hard to actually get chemistry out. Um, but also very fast moving. Um, these are FGK, but we're trying to get to the hotter, so therefore potentially younger um, types of stars that we can actually do chemical chemical abundances for to see what we can do. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for a beautiful talk once again. Uh, thanks for answering all this uh, barrage of uh, questions uh, triggered by it. Uh, and so we'll see you soon uh, in uh, less than an hour. So thank you very much.